Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's, game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. We both love the Olympics and Paralympics, and we love history. And most of all, we love Olympic and Paralympic history, which is why we are on a journey through all of the Olympic and Paralympic Games from the ancient Olympics held at Olympia all the way to now. So Jim Thorpe is remembered as the first Native American to win an Olympic gold medal for the U.S. during the Olympic Games in Stockholm 1912, which we talked about on our last episode. He was an incredibly versatile athlete playing American football, both in college and later as a professional. He played professional baseball and even some basketball. And on top of being the first winner of the pentathlon and the decathlon in the Olympics, which of course require a whole other level of versatility that we'll get into, but his story is one of continuous struggle. And the fact that he was stripped of his two gold medals is only one piece of that story. So today we're going to walk through the life of this incredible athlete and the legacy that he left behind. So, Sarah, this is probably one of those things that we don't necessarily have to say, but at the same time, we have to say it. But anyone who knows a little bit about Jim Thorpe's story should probably also be aware that there are going to be some discussions of both racism and substance abuse happening in this episode. So... That's to say that here's your parental warning before we get into the topic of Jim Thorpe's life. Just in case you have little ones listening, uh, there may be some things that we talk about in here that I don't know. You might not be ready to talk about with your kids or want to handle it a certain way. But uh, Sarah, when did you first hear about Jim Thorpe? Mm, you know, I've always kind of known of him as far back as I can remember. And mm-hmm. part of that might be the benefit of living in Texas, close to Oklahoma, to where, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't know, maybe he was a regional sports figure, or maybe it was when I was the nerdy little first grader checking out books from the library about the Olympics. I knew yeah. about him. But as far as diving deep into his story, it was not until um, I'd say the last couple of years that I started to really recognize the hardships associated with him, that he was much more than just an Olympic athlete. And then the things that happened after the Olympics with his medals, which we will get into. Um, And then of course, getting ready for this episode, I feel like there was so much that I was ignorant about. So I'm really happy that we're talking about him. What about you? Yeah, I... (sighs) I cannot remember for sure when I first heard about him, but it was probably a good 10 years ago, at least. But I feel like the first things I ever heard about Jim Thorpe were all the pretty parts of the story, right? The fact that he won both the pentathlon and the decathlon the first year that they were introduced at the Olympics. But none of this other stuff that we're going to talk about that, that is really difficult and really hard. So... You know, it's one of those reminders that we have to remember that these athletes that have so much talent, they also have lives off of the track. They have Mm. lives that they go back to after the games that aren't always so pretty. And so, you know, we have to remember that athletes aren't just there for our entertainment and for us to feel good when they win for whatever country we're from but that they are human beings with stories of their own. And I think Jim's Mm -hmm. story is a, is a really good reminder of the support that these athletes need sometimes. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, even though he was a very notable athlete Mm -hmm. in that time, um, you know, obviously being Native American and facing racism and stuff, he obviously had his struggles too. But thinking even jumping ahead to the year 2022, that even some of the most famous athletes that we see don't get the help and the support that they need. And so thinking about how even back then that was the case, that it didn't even matter how 
successful you may have been on the playing field or how no- notable you may have been. Um, that, you know, like you said, there's there's so much they have to come back to. And it's and I know that we'll continue to talk about this in the future when we talk about other athletes and other Olympic moments. But right. It's an ongoing thing to for for all of us to remember. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, so, yeah. So we just wanted to kind of lead off the episode with a bit of a warning that there are some heavy topics in this episode. There are some things in this episode that could potentially be triggering for people. So just want you to be aware of that before we get into the topic of his life. But also just a couple of business items that we need to get out of the way too. Of first off, since since Jim Thorpe did win his medals at Stockholm 1912, which we talked about on our last episode, I needed to let everyone know that a a kind Reddit user let me know <laughs> this week about a documentary that you can find on HBO Max that features close to three hours of actual footage from the 1912 games. So I have not. Awesome. It is really awesome. I've not gotten all the way through it yet. I've watched about the first half hour and it's really cool because it even includes some segments of the Swedish trials before the games. But yeah, so far it's really cool to watch. So if you have HBO Max, you should go check that out. They have a ton of other documentaries about different Olympic games, too. So I'm definitely going to be adding that to my list and research. Um, Thank you, Reddit. Once again. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Thank you, Reddit, for the recommendation. Um, and, And so on that note of research, we also wanted to let people know that this is our last episode for this season. So uh, we're going to be taking a bit of a break so that I can get a bit of a jump start on some research, but also just because we need a little bit of a break from recording to deal with some other uh, life things going on. And we will return with new episodes the week of August 22nd. Now, we're not going to leave you completely high and dry until August. So in the meantime, during the gap, we are going to have some bonus episodes that we are going to release. There's going to be a couple of our practice episodes from when we were planning the show. They are incredibly messy and not very well edited because we were (laughs) learning how to do things. But hopefully that'll be entertaining for everyone. (laughs) Yeah, Um, just, just remember that they were for practice, but they should be informative. Yeah, yeah. So you will get to hear what our practice sessions, <laughs> what they sounded like, because we've decided we're going to release those for the whole world to hear. And then we're also going to release a couple of episodes that aren't really episodes. They're more just unscripted discussions that we had specifically about the Olympics and Paralympics in Beijing this year. So Since we recorded those conversations, we felt like this is a good time to release those while it's still 2022. And so you still have a little bit of content before we come back to talking through the game's odyssey. Not to mention it's summer and it's hot, especially down here in Texas. So, you know, just think back to the winter sports and think about how cold it was. Um, Hopefully that'll cool some people off for the summer. Yeah, cool off mentally, (laughs) even if you can't physically. (laughs) So um, and then, Sarah, what are some other things we're going to do during the break? Yeah, so we're hoping to do some giveaways, maybe a book, Mm -hmm. maybe some other things. But we will definitely keep you posted on our social media accounts. On Twitter, we are at Games Odyssey Pod. Instagram, we are at Games Odyssey Pod. And Facebook, Mm -hmm. The Games Odyssey. Or, you know, you can always find the links in our show notes. Um, We also have a survey that is Mm -hmm. in in the show notes. And we love feedback. We we are not afraid of feedback. And we would love to know, (laughs) um, just if you're listening to this, we would love to know what you think, um, things that you would want to see more of, maybe less uh, or hear more of, hear less of. Um, (laughs) Please be kind, but also honest. We would appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) We want to hear, you know, we want to hear ideas and see how we can make the show better. I'm not going to pretend like I have the greatest ideas or all the ideas in the world. So uh, definitely fill out that survey while we're taking a break because I will be looking at what you have to say. 
But before we get into the life of Jim Thorpe, let's take a quick little break and then we will jump in talking about his background and how his life started out. James Francis Thorpe was born on either May 22nd or May 28th, 1887. He was actually <laughs> born as a twin. <laughs> I know, we don't know his date, but, you know. Yeah, it's already it. confusing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. It is kind of funny that we're like, oh, yeah, yeah. casual, this or that. Who knows? Yeah. But May, <laughs> he was born in May of 1887. Um, <laughs> he was actually born as a twin alongside his mm-hmm. brother, Charlie, since that's how twins work. And he was baptized into the Catholic Church as Jacobus Franciscus Thorpe. But uh, we'll just call him Jin. Part of the uncertainty with his birth date is because there's no birth certificate on record for him. He himself once told a newspaper in 1943 that his birthday was on May 28th, but the baptismal certificate says May 22nd. So, you know, I mean, at least we're within a week there of the dates being accurate. Yeah, but, you know, how weird would it be if he was actually wrong about his own birth date? <laughs> what if the baptismal certificate's actually correct? Because it hey. might be. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, you got to love history sometimes. So regardless of when his birthday may have been, Jim grew up as a member of the Sock and Fox Nation in Indian Territory, which is part of what we now call Oklahoma and was part of the Thunder Clan, which is a pretty awesome name. If you're going to be part of a clan, you want to be a part of the Thunder Clan. (laughs) Um, And the Thunder Clan, what they're known for is that was the same clan as Chief Blackhawk. So he was a um, relative of some sort with Chief Blackhawk. Now, Jim's father was Hiram Thorpe, and uh, Hiram had an Irish father, but a, Sa- a Sock and Fox Indian mother. So he was half European ancestry, half Native American ancestry. And then Jim's mother, Charlotte View, had a French father and a Potawatomi mother. So also half European heritage and half native heritage. So yeah, he had that happening on both sides of his family. Now, in the tradition of the Sock and Fox people, Jim was also given a native name based on something occurring around the time of his birth. So in his case, that meant some light that was brightening the path in front of the cabin where he was being born. So his native name was Wathohuk, which means pathlit by great flash of lightning, or for short, bright path, which is a pretty cool name. So he's got like four different names going on here. (laughs) Better than four different birthdays. Yeah, yeah. Two different (laughs) birthdays and four, you know, different names, but you know, same guy. So (laughs) there you go. (laughs) All right. Thorpe's family was Roman Catholic, which was a faith he observed throughout his life. And as a child, he and Charlie attended the Sock and Fox Indian Agency School. But then Charlie died of pneumonia when they were just nine years old. After this, Thorpe tried to run away from school several times, and so his father ended up sending him to the Haskell Institute Indian Boarding School in Lawrence, Kansas, to deter him from running away. And side note to that is the um, Haskell Institute Indian Boarding School is now Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence. And if Mm -hmm. you find yourself in Lawrence, Kansas... um, It's a small enough town that you'll probably end up driving by it. I've driven by it many times and did not realize that that was where Jim Thorpe went to school until now. So, yeah, there you go. If you're in Kansas, send us a picture if you go by. (laughs) Two years later, when he was 11 or 12, Thorpe's mother died from complications during childbirth. As you can imagine, this sent him into a depression, increased the tensions with his father, and finally, Jim chose to leave home and go work on a horse ranch. He eventually came back home when he was 16 and decided to attend the Carlisle Indian Industrial School, located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which was considered the flagship Indian boarding school during its existence. 
So around 1904, he was really exposed to sports for the first time and noticed for his natural athletic abilities by legendary American football coach, Pop Warner. Yeah, and that's a name that any casual football fan is going to know. In fact, Mm -hmm. honestly, even a lot of non-football fans know (laughs) the name Pop Warner. He's that famous over here in the U.S. Um, Mm -hmm. But man, that's that's a lot of loss in a short amount of time. Losing his twin, which I mean, the the bond for twins is just so special. And for him to lose his twin and then his mother at such a young age, like we're already starting off things really rough. And unfortunately, it's about to get a little bit rougher for Jim. So while he was there at school at Carlisle, his father was then injured in a hunting accident. He got gangrene and then he died. So that officially left Jim as an orphan at, you know, the age of 16. Um, Now, thankfully, it does seem like they were able to reconcile their difficult relationship at least to some degree (laughs) there at the end of his dad's life uh, because it's reported that the last words his father spoke to him were son you're an Indian I want you to show other races what an Indian can do so you know hopefully they did have a moment there at the end where they were able to come to some understanding and peace between each other yeah yeah I hope that that's accurate for sure I, I know it's yeah. hard to it's hard to get through this part of his early life without being really sad. It is. Yeah. I mean, here you've got a. I mean, he's a kid still. He's a kid <laughs> at this age yeah. and he's he's run away from home. He's worked on a horse ranch. He's lost everyone in his direct family. Uh, it's incredibly sad. Um, and as if that's not enough sadness, we're going to throw in a little bit of ugliness, too, because we do have to address for a minute the ugly side of Carlisle's school. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of research that you can go out there and look into the history of some of these Indian boarding schools and some of the things that they did that were not great. We're not going to completely go down that here because it would, we could literally talk about that for hours if we were to unpack everything. Uh, But one of the things I think we'll just talk about here because it relates specifically to Jim's athletic uh, career is the fact that a lot of times at Carlisle, the ethnicity of the students would get used for marketing purposes. So the name of their school team was the Indians. And whenever they played white teams, a lot of times the newspapers would portray this and use language like it was a conflict of Indians versus whites. And so, you know, we should also note that it wasn't until 1924 that all Native Americans in the U.S. were actually granted U.S. citizenship. So before that, if a Native American wanted to be a U.S. citizen, they usually had to make some kind of concession to adopt white practices, reject their ethnic upbringing and practices. Obviously a terrible choice for someone to have to make. But but yeah, the media was not helpful in this, uh, you know, playing up if, you know, if the Indians won a game talking about how, oh, this is their them taking revenge for what white people have done to them or, you know, vice versa. If they lost to a white team, it being played up of, oh, we see history replaying itself here on the court. So, again, just really ugly stuff. Yeah. And like to put it in perspective, like these are the things that always surprise me um, Mm -hmm. is that that was less than 100 years ago. And yeah, that just does not seem like that long ago. And and I know we still have issues of like we're not naive to that, but it's crazy to me that less than 100 Mm -hmm. years ago, Native Americans um, had to struggle if they wanted to be an American citizen. Yeah. I mean, and that's even a little part of my family story, Sarah. I don't think we've really ever talked about this, but. But I mean, my grandmother was a quarter Cherokee and, you know, so her her grandmother then was um, full blood Cherokee and she married a white man. And so she would have been a part of this story of essentially having to forsake her background and her heritage in order to assimilate into white society. 
So, you know, it was one of those things that my grandmother always knew and told me like, yeah, I'm, I'm a quarter Cherokee, but you know, she didn't really have any connection to that culture because her grandmother had had to, you know, literally divorce from her mm-hmm. culture in order to marry her grandfather. So, you know, you know, you think about just all the lost culture and history and heritage when people are forced to make that kind of choice. So, yeah. um, yeah. So really sad and unnecessary. <laughs> Indeed. But, yeah. So anyway, so back to Jim, because, you know, this hopefully gives a little bit of context for the world he was growing up into. Uh, but while he was playing for Carlisle's football team, he was so good that he became a three time All-American, which is a pretty huge deal. And if you're not a football fan and you're really not sure what that means to be an All-American, if you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, then think about that scene where Forrest goes to the White House and (laughs) and meets the president because he gets named to the All-American team. And then you'll have a little bit of an idea of how big of a deal that it was that he, you know, got made an All-American, not just once, not just twice, but three times while he was at Carlisle huge deal which begs the question if he was so good at football how in the world did he get introduced to athletics or what we call here in the u.s track and field well in 1907 while he was still at carlisle he was walking past the track one day and he saw a group of some of the high school's high jumpers competing against each other and he was just wearing his street clothes at the time (laughs) but He thought it looked fun and decided he wanted to give it a shot. And I guess they were cool with it. Maybe they thought it would be funny to see this guy in his normal clothes who was not on the track team trying to do high jump. And he ended up beating all of them with a five foot nine inch jump, (laughs) even though he'd never done it before. So, yeah, I think he has some talent. Yeah, just a little bit. (laughs) Um, So back to football. Uh, In 1911, he started to be noticed on a national level, uh, and he would play both running back and defensive back. So, again, very versatile, being able to (laughs) play uh, both sides, offense and defense. Uh, He also, if that wasn't enough, he was also a place kicker and a punter for the team. So practically a one man football team. (laughs) You could just put him into almost any position and he would excel. And during an upset victory against Harvard, which was a top ranked team at that time, he scored all of the team's four field goals, which is what ended up putting them ahead. And during the 1912 college football season, he scored 25 touchdowns and Carlisle went 11 1 that season. Oh, yeah. And during that same season, he led the team in a 27-6 victory over the West Point Army team, which included a young Dwight D. Eisenhower. So should be a pretty familiar name for those of us here in the U.S. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So, yeah. uh, So and if you don't know who that is because you are in a different country, uh, he became president of our country. So pretty big deal. Uh, He was also a general during World War II. So, mm-hmm. again, pretty big deal. Seems to be very respected. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's one of the presidents yeah. that people usually... I mean, I know he no president's perfect, but he mm-hmm. he's one that people seem to just appreciate a lot because of, I think, his military service, too. So, anyway. Yeah. And if you live in North Texas, like we do, if you just drive up the road from where we live a little bit, uh, you'll drive through Denison, Texas, which is uh, where he was born. So... Yeah. Uh, there's a part of that road that's named after him. Anyway, before moving to Kansas, there's your other Kansas connection. Gosh, my yes. in-laws will be so proud. Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to the that's fam. Right. That's right. Yeah, he did end up going to Kansas. But anyway, so, yeah, you know, here's here's another Forrest Gump comparison because you got all these like famous people who kind of come in yeah. and out of Thorpe's life. Um, so Dwight D. Eisenhower, here's what he said of Thorpe later on when remembering this game. He said he could do anything better than any other football player I ever saw. So 
you know, that's kind of high praise, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For his entire life, Thorpe would actually consider football his favorite sport. Uh, in fact, he didn't even compete in any track and field events in either 1910 or 1911, which is insane when you think about the fact that he went to the Olympics in 1912. And today, right. of course, you know, people who are trying to get into the Olympics, they're, they're training in their sport every single day. And here he is, 1910, 1911, not even touching the track a bit. Right. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Again, the guy's got some talent. <laughs> he does. So on that note, here are all the sports that he competed in while he was in college. American football, baseball, lacrosse, and ballroom dancing. Yes, Jim Thorpe won the Intercollegiate Ballroom Dancing Championship in 1912, the same year that he would end up going to the Stockholm Olympic Games. So all around, just a very athletic guy. I don't know what else yeah. to say about that. What could he not do? Uh, apparently nothing. I mean, yeah, if, if you need a good dance partner, he was your guy too. So <laughs> had you ever heard this about the dancing? Because this is no, new information that is, for me. That is brand new information <laughs> for me. And now I'm start sitting here wondering if the Winter Olympics had been a thing yet, would we have mm -hmm. seen Jen be one of those dudes that, and I should say women too, because they've done it as well, um, mm -hmm. that competes in both the Summer and the Winter Olympics. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he would have been because I cannot handle how talented he was. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think he totally would have been. Um, he, and, and he probably would have just thrown a dart at a dartboard <laughs> labeled with different sports and just like, oh, whatever it lands on, I'll just Wait. go do that. No, he would have been <laughs> he would have been a sliding athlete. He would have done um, oh, yeah. skeleton or bobsled or something because they they take a lot of track they, athletes. Yeah, they recruit lots of sprinters for bobsled in particular. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, okay, absolutely. so see, now we have it because this totally matters for this conversation that our speculation yeah. is that if Jim Thorpe became a winter athlete, he would have been pushing a bobsled. But let's face it, he probably could have done <laughs> figure skating if he really wanted it's to true. as With well. With the ballroom dancing. <laughs> With the ballroom dancing, yeah. Oh, man. Okay, so yeah, so this gets us up to just before the Olympic Games, which is why we're here after all. But let's take a quick little break and then we'll come back and talk about what Jim did at the Olympics. All right. All right. So in the spring of 1912, Jim started his Olympic training, focusing on jumping, hurdles, shot put, pole vault, javelin, discus, hammer throw, <laughs> and the 56 pound weight throw. I'm not sure focusing is the best word <laughs> here with all that. And again, the fact that his Olympic training started in the same year as the Olympics, like you just yeah. talked about, very different. Yeah. Most people train their whole life for their Olympic events. But yeah. it was during the Eastern Olympic trials in New York that the New York Times first mentioned him in a headline that read, Indian Thorpe in Olympiad. Redskin from Carlisle will strive for place on American team. This kind of language is very indicative of how Native Americans were discussed in popular culture and in the media. So yeah. like the same way that you were talking about stuff with Carlisle and the way he was spoken mm -hmm. about, it's just really ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, nowadays you could obviously not print that without losing right. your job, right? Uh, but it was very normal back then. That does not make it okay. It wasn't right then. It's still not right, right now, uh, but it is kind of indicative of how he was treated. And that that's what made him a headline. Not his mm -hmm. actual ability, but, oh my gosh, look at this Native American dude who's trying to get into the Olympics, like... The, the headline was his race and not his ability, which is mm -hmm. really unfortunate. Right. So Jim's versatility obviously would come in hand because there were two new athletic events being added to the Olympic program for Stockholm 1912, the pentathlon and the decathlon. Now, okay, so 
we're constantly having to correct ourselves on this show, and that's okay. We're always learning new things. So I literally just learned after we had already recorded our 1912 episode that there were actually two pentathlon events added at the 1912 Games. And uh, Sarah, you may remember when we were having that conversation, I even admitted, hey, I'm kind of confused about this. Like, why... <laughs> like where's yeah. equestrian in this list where's shooting in this list especially when we knew that george Patton had used his own colt revolver and and i even said i'm gonna go research this more because i don't know what's going on yes <laughs> so. and you did research it more and had the light bulb moment and i did this is where we're all learning together so this is a good opportunity with thorpe's story to correct the record and you know, uh, clear up the confusion. Okay, so the pentathlon that Thorpe was going to enter at the Olympics, uh, it consisted of long jump, javelin, 200 meter dash, discus, and 1500 meter run. These are all track and field events, obviously, and they are based on the ancient pentathlon, except that they substituted the 1500 meter run for wrestling since there was also a long distance run that had featured in the ancient games. So anyway, if you want to hear more about that, you can go back to our two episodes about the original Olympic games or what we call the OG Olympic games, where we did talk about that ancient version of the pentathlon. So I learned we're going to talk about Reddit again here. I, I learned from a helpful soul on Reddit that over time, this traditional version of the pentathlon has evolved into the heptathlon. Okay, now heptathlon looks different for men and women in the Olympic Games. Again, whole other topic we'll probably get into another time, but that's why we don't have the traditional pentathlon anymore as it, it morphed into the heptathlon. On the other hand, the modern pentathlon that was also introduced in 1912, that's the one that Coubertin came up with to emulate the experience of the modern soldier. Or, well, the 1912 version of a modern military courier. Uh, so that's the one that features swimming, equestrian, shooting, fencing, cross country. Again, the one that George S. Patton competed in. Which so, one could make the argument he was the modern soldier. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so... So yeah, so that clears up the confusion of why if you research pentathlon results that you're going to get two different ones. And for me, that also cleared up the confusion of why do we always refer to it as modern pentathlon? Well, because in 1912, they had traditional pentathlon and modern. So we'll kind of get back on track now that we've got that cleared up. So yeah, Jim Thorpe was not having to do any shooting. He wasn't having to ride any horses or swim or any of that. Uh, now, meanwhile, the idea of the decathlon had been around since at least the 1880s, from what I found, and sometimes it featured in American track meets, so there was a version of it that had been on the program for the 1904 Games in St. Louis, but in 1912, it was added to the Olympic Games with a slightly different set of events than what they had done before. 100 meter, long jump, shot put high jump, 400 meter, discus, 110 meter hurdles, pole vault, javelin, and finally, the 1500 meter run. Whew. Okay, got through it. It's a, it's a lot to say. <laughs> Imagine competing yeah. in it. <laughs> I know. That's why we talk about it. Yes. We don't actually do it. <laughs> I mean, we, we could do those things. It's just that it would take us a lot longer and we would need a lot of ice baths between events and stuff. But anyway... I mean, we could sell tickets. It would be funny. Um, I've tried to do pole vault before, and it is one of the funniest things you'll ever see I, because I am not good at it. That is one that, no, absolutely not. Um, I just, no, I would be injured so fast. Anyway, obviously, the versatility required in these events made them really appealing for someone like Thorpe, and he earned his place on the Olympic team because of his all-around ability. So while he would compete in other events, he really had his sights set on those two. And as we mentioned in the last episode, another American competing in both events was Avery Brundage. 
dun, dun, dun. I feel like we always need music whenever we say his name because it's I know, like I know. we're always <laughs> saying like there's that name. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, <Yeah. laughs> in addition to the pentathlon and decathlon, Thorpe competed in the long jump and the high jump. The first competition for the pentathlon was held on July 7th. He ended up winning four of the five events. The only event he didn't win was Javelin, where he placed third, which he had never competed in before the (laughs) Olympic trials. So it's okay, buddy, that you got third. (laughs) I've never competed in Javelin. I would never get third in the Olympic Games. He qualified for the high jump final and finished in a tie for fourth, and he placed seventh in long jump. He also played on a baseball team at the Olympics since it was a demonstration sport where his team, the U.S. East team, won. So yeah. why not fill my schedule with all these track and field events and then uh, <laughs> go play some baseball? And then play baseball to relax in between. <laughs> so seriously, yeah, he had a busy games. So, OK, so after all of that, uh, he had the decathlon. Now, the local favorite was Swedish athlete Hugo Weislander. Um, And okay, so Hugo's a good guy, but we need to talk about an ugly point in this story um, for the decathlon. So coming into the final event, uh, which was the 1500 meter, as I just listed off, all that Thorpe had to do was finish at least seventh and he would win gold. So that's how far ahead he was in the points. But someone stole his shoes. And this was literally when the runners were being called to the track. And he discovers that his shoes have gone, well, not missing. Some Someone just straight up jacked them. Okay. So... I mean, what do you do? Uh, um, you know, some people would just, I, I guess, call it quits there. Uh, now, Jim Thorpe is not that type of person. What he did was he found two worn out shoes that did not match each other. In fact, one of them he literally found in a trash can. OK, uh, one of the shoes he found was a size too small. The other one was two sizes too big. So being uh, very creative, (laughs) he put a thin dress sock on the foot for the shoe that was too small, and he doubled up the socks on the other foot for the shoe that was too big. And then he ran over to the starting line, making it there just in time for the start. Uh, He actually trailed for the first three laps, and then, which, okay, it's a 1500 meter, so a mile, basically four laps around the track. So three laps, he's he's behind. He catches up with the leading pack during the final turn. He kicked it into a dead on sprint and won the race by 25 meters, meters, 25 (laughs) meters. He won the race in the last lap which is crazy because again he only had to play seventh Mm -hmm. yeah that just kind of tells you the type of guy that he was that he was not gonna settle he was gonna give his all no matter Mm -hmm. what and 25 meters is a lot (laughs) that's a lot to win a a race like that especially when you've been behind Mm -hmm. everyone else for three-fourths of the race yeah it's absolutely insane so in the end thorpe won the decathlon by 688 points with as we mentioned earlier a swedish favorite hugo weislander coming in second he placed in the top four for all 10 events and his record of 8413 points would stand for almost two decades Now, at that time, all of the medals were still being presented during the closing ceremony, different than what we see today. So when King Gustav V of Sweden gave Thorpe his two gold medals, it's reported that the king said, you, sir, are the greatest athlete in the world. I would consider it an honor to shake your hand. And Thorpe's response? Thanks, king. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, 
we're not used to having kings over here in America, so that'd probably be my response too. Yeah, right. <laughs> now, some biographers believe that that story's been made up later, but I don't know. I really like to think it's true. <laughs> oh, it's totally true. We're going to run with that. Like, fact, yeah. ch- fact checkers, we don't need you. You can just skip this part. We are going to say that that is true. Yep. I would yep. like to think that's how I would greet a king as well. Following the Olympic team's return, he was a star and was part of a massive ticker tape parade in New York City. He later said, I heard people yelling my name and I couldn't realize how one fellow could have so many friends. And if that's just not that endearing, quote. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad no, that, that's, I love that I am so happy that with his hardships growing up and other things that we'll get into that at least on that one day, he Mm -hmm. felt like he had so many friends. He needed that. Yeah. In 1913, he married Iva M. Miller and they would have four children together, James, Gail, Charlotte, and Francis. Yeah. So, I mean, at this point of his life, which you just mentioned, it seems like things are actually going pretty well. I mean, he got through college. So he's got that going for him. He mm-hmm. just won two gold medals and met a king and just had a huge parade and all these people know his name, getting married. I mean, all of these things are going pretty good. Yeah, I would what say. could possibly go wrong? <sighs> yeah, and that's about as good uh. of a segue as we can have. <laughs> so, all right. So we, we've already teed this up, but um, we have to ask the question, how did Thorpe lose his medals? After all, this was well before the age of when people would be banned for performance enhancing drugs, which is usually these days why we see people lose their medals. Mm -hmm. But this was the age of the ridiculously strict amateur code for the Olympics. So this meant that athletes couldn't receive money prizes They couldn't be instructors in any sport, and they couldn't even compete against professionals, even if they weren't getting paid themselves. This was new information to me, Sarah. I had no idea about this third one. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah, you would still be disqualified and lose your amateur status, which is just insane. Um, So, yeah, so you had to be really careful to make sure that you were following all these rules to a T. But anyway, in the U.S. at that time, these amateur codes were very strictly monitored and they were enforced by the AAU, the American Athletic Union. And more specifically, one of the co-founders of the AAU, James Edward Sullivan. Sarah? We recognize that name, don't we? Oh, we sure do. We've talked about him before. (laughs) Yes, we have. When did we talk about James Sullivan? (laughs) Refresh us a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so, okay, all the episodes are running together. I hate it when you put me on the spot, but this is when we talked about we, he was effective with St. Louis, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was 1904 yeah. St. Louis Games. He was yes. the organizer of yes. those games. And he was and he was super shady. Remember, he came up with anthropology days, the super racist display. Yep. Um, he was the guy who treated the marathon runners like a science experiment. Yes, you and know, did not nearly, give them water. Yeah, nearly killing several people. And then he and then he tried to play it off as, oh, the marathon is an evil thing. Like, oh, we shouldn't even be doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Not a good guy. And now he's coming into Thorpe's story and things are, you know, the the you know what's about to hit the fan. So um, yeah. now that we've got James Sullivan in the picture, what happens next? <laughs> In January of 1913, news came out that Thorpe had played professional baseball prior to the Olympics. Now, that was true. He had played professionally in the Eastern Carolina League from 1909 to 1910. But you can't compare this to what you would think of as a professional baseball player today in the MLB. His pay, if you will, ranged from $2 per game to maybe as much as $35 in a week. $35 a week is the equivalent of around $1,100 today. Now that might sound good, but again, he didn't get that all the time and he only made that kind of money during the season. So generally speaking, 
His pay mostly covered his expenses, and it would be more accurate to say he was semi-professional because he couldn't fully live off of what he made. That $1,100 number that you threw out, again, that's in today's dollars, okay? Um, Mm -hmm. But that would have been like a really busy week, and that would have been the peak of the season. And as you just mentioned, he wasn't getting that all the time. That was only during the baseball season it essentially covered his food and travel expenses and and that's about it so yeah yeah semi-professional is a good way to put it um and also it's worth mentioning that this practice really was not that unusual at the time lots of college students would earn a bit of money during the summer by playing professional ball but here's the kicker if they did that they were usually playing under a fake name so that they wouldn't get in trouble with the AAU and lose their amateur status. But who didn't use a fake name because he was an honest guy? Jim Thorpe. He should have been shady like James Sullivan. (laughs) No, he shouldn't have been. (laughs) No, we're we're glad he was honest. Yeah, we're glad he was honest. Um, You are correct. (laughs) So, you know what, Uh, there's there's a part of me that has to wonder, was this news about him being professional in baseball? You know, who leaked this news to the papers? Was it the same person who stole his shoes because someone had it out for him? That's that's my conspiracy theory. Usually you have the conspiracy theories, but that (laughs) that's mine here. (laughs) I mean, if it's not the shoe person, it's someone who was very clearly jealous him yeah um yeah i don't know avery brundage <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe but there's yeah. my conspiracy theory i'll blame avery because <laughs> it's easy to blame avery for lots of things yes yeah. we'll, we'll we'll come back around to that here in a little bit okay uh we'll put a pin in that for now <laughs> so so here's the deal um even though it was leaked in the papers and it was made into this headline here's what's kind of funny about that the public didn't really care about the fact that he had played semi-professional baseball. Like most people are kind of like, eh, who cares? He's a good athlete. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, give him some money for doing that. But of course, James Sullivan cared very much about the fact that this came out in the news because, and this came out later on, but it actually seems like the AAU may have actually known about Thorpe playing ball professionally before the Olympics, and they may have ignored that. And they may have hoped that no one else would find out. But now that it was out there and had the potential to make them look bad to the IOC, well, that's when a guy like Sullivan would finally decide to care, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, once once he, you know, had a reason oh, crap, this might make me look bad. Um, I I should get really strict and severe about it, okay? So Thorpe, being the honest guy that he is, he actually wrote a letter to Sullivan admitting that the newspaper stories were correct. In that letter, he said, I hope I will be partly excused by the fact that I was simply an Indian schoolboy and did not know all about such things. In fact, I did not know that I was doing wrong because I was doing what I knew several other college men had done, except that they did not use their own names. So yeah, so he's even pointing out the fact that he knew other people who were changing their names, and he thought that that was ridiculous. And he was like, no, I'm going to play under my own name. And again, we have to remember, he has no one supporting him. His Mm -hmm. whole family has passed away. Like, how else was he supposed to live if he didn't find a way to make money? Right. Yeah, the guy had to feed himself. Yeah, but uh, anyway, you know, he's hoping he'll be excused by that fact. And he's not even mentioning that in this letter. He's not even, you know, in this little paragraph that right. He's not even talking about all the hardships he's already been. He's just basically Mm -hmm. saying, hey, I didn't know this was a rule. That that's all right. he's claiming is just ignorance of I didn't know the rules like I would have abided by them if I if I'd known. But he was not excused, of course. Mm-hmm. The AAU withdrew Thorpe's amateur status, and the IOC unanimously voted to strip Thorpe of his two gold medals and his record. 
and they reallocated the medals for the pentathlon and the decathlon for 1912, giving gold in pentathlon to Sweden's Hugo Weislander and gold in decathlon to Norway's Ferdinand V. In fact, it's worth noting that the two both considered Thorpe the champion and refused the gold medals when the IOC sent them, which is absolutely incredible. I cannot yeah. imagine that happening. Yeah, hats off to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Weislander eventually did accept it in 1951, but only so he could give it to the Swedish School of Sport and Health, and then it was stolen in 1954 and never found. From what we found, I believe this was the very first instance of an Olympic medal being stripped from an athlete and then having to reallocate. Nowadays, it seems like that's just another Tuesday at the IOC. Ain't that <laughs> yeah. the truth? Yeah. <laughs> but get this. The AAU and the IOC didn't even follow the rules that had been laid out in the official rulebook for the 1912 Olympiad. In the rulebook, it said that any protest about a result had to be made within 30 days from the closing ceremony. And again, the news didn't break until about six months later. Mm -hmm. But no one seemed to actually consult the rulebook about this. Or it's possible they just didn't care enough to consult the rulebook. So long story short, Jim Thorpe should have never had his medals and titles taken away. But he didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The one good thing to come from all of this was that Dorp started getting offers to play professional baseball since he couldn't be in the AAU anymore. He even considered playing professional hockey in Toronto at one point, <laughs> which he probably would have been good at too. Yeah, so see, that could have been his winter sport. Yeah, so he could skate. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, he ended up signing with the New York Giants, which later became the San Francisco Giants. And he spent a total of six seasons playing in the MLB, also playing for the Milwaukee Brewers, the Cincinnati Reds, and the Boston Braves until 1919. From 1919 to 1921, he played in the minor leagues. In between baseball seasons, he was also playing professional football, <laughs> playing for six different teams in the NFL. In his uh, quote-unquote free time, he also played professional basketball on an all-Native American team, which is pretty cool. So he finally retired from football when he was 41 years old, and from 1920 to 1921, he actually served as the first president of the American Professional Football Association, which a year later in 1922 became the NFL. So yeah, a lot of, lot of history there with football. Unfortunately, his professional sports career, when it ended at the age of 41, it also coincided with the beginning of the Great Depression. And so this started a, another really difficult phase of life for him because with sports now, you know, taken out of the picture form. And again, it's not like he was making millions of dollars like what we see happening in professional sports today. So during the Great Depression, he struggled to earn a living. Um, he was trying to make ends meet by working odd jobs in things like construction, working security, even doing ditch digging just to get by. And unfortunately, these years would also be marked by the beginning of him having some really heavy drinking in his life um, and subsequent alcoholism which would be something that he would battle with for the rest of his life from there on out. Mm. So things, you know, seem like they've been going pretty well. You know, the loss of the medals, obviously a huge bummer. But again, at least he did get a sports career out of it. But then, mm -hmm. I mean, this timing is just obviously really, really bad for him. Yeah. And in 1925, his wife, Iva, filed for divorce claiming desertion as the cause, and mm. that was the end of their marriage. A year later, he married his second wife, Frida Kirkpatrick, who at the time was managing the baseball team he was playing for. Together, they would also have four children, Philip, William, Richard, and John. During the Depression, though, he worked as an extra for several movies, often acting in Westerns as an Indian chief. Although in the 1932 comedy Always Kickin', he got the chance to play a football coach. 
And he also played an umpire in the 1940 film Newt Rockne All-American, which also featured future president Ronald Reagan. So here we go. There we go. Forrest, Forrest Gumping again <laughs> with all these yeah. interactions. With Forrest Gumping. I love it. <laughs> future, future presidents. Like, how many yeah. did he meet? My goodness. Seriously, though. <laughs> this was also when he sold the rights to his life story to MGM for $1,500, which would be around $29,000 in today's dollars. With current inflation, it will be $30,000 by the end of this sentence. <laughs> Indeed. If you're listening into the, if you're listening to this in the future, hopefully it got better. Yeah. <laughs> but then in 1941, after 15 years of marriage, he and Frida divorced. Again, you know, we think of people being in the movies being this like illustrious career. And even though he mm-hmm. was in the movie scene for a little bit during the depression, he was very much on the you know fringes of it. And again, we see you know this kind of you know, strange thing happening where he's always cast as an Indian most of the Mm -hmm. time, which I mean, you know, to be fair, I guess it's better for him to be cast in a role like that than them, you know, painting up a white guy, which was pretty common. So that's probably why he was open to taking those kind of parts. But it was, you know, still just kind of a shame that he got stuck in these roles that he couldn't really do anything with that he would have these Mm -hmm. opportunities and obviously just doing whatever he can to get by. Mm -hmm. Now he would get married again in 1945, this time to Patricia Askew, who he would remain married to until his death. So, you know, third time's the charm. So good, good for him. He found someone else uh, to be with. Uh, That same year, he also joined the U.S. Merchant Marines, but that didn't last very long. So again, still struggling to find work. And in the early 50s, he continued to be negatively affected by his drinking and, well, he ran out of money. In fact, in 1950, that was also when he was diagnosed with cancer on his lower lip. And when he was admitted to the hospital in Philadelphia, he was actually designated as a charity case. Mm. Um, I found a New York Times article about this that was published on November 10th, 1950. And in that article, it actually talked about how his wife, Patricia, she told the hospital workers that they were completely broke, that Jim had spent a lot of his money helping other people, that he had actually given away too much money to help out others, and that he'd also been exploited by people so that factored into their situation too that seems like anytime they did have a little bit of money people came knocking on his door asking for help and he would help them instead of you know doing something for himself but Hmm. um on the bright side the surgery to remove the cancer was a success so you know we gotta throw in a good thing here and there yeah Eventually, his life story was made into a movie, but by Warner Brothers in the 1951 film Jim Thorpe All-American, where he was portrayed by Burt Lancaster, and he was paid $15,000, and he was an extra in one scene playing a coaching assistant. Burt Lancaster is uh, not Native American, so they (laughs) did find a white guy with a name, a star that, you know, they said, oh, whatever, close enough, right? Yeah, Um, and I'm not a film buff like you, but I know enough to know that Bert is white. So uh, yeah, I've I've not watched that movie for a number of reasons, but that's that's a big one <laughs> that mm-hmm. why I have not watched it. So, but over the next couple of years, he continued to have health problems, in particular with his heart, which, as we now know, can often be connected with alcoholism. It was also around this time that he and Patricia moved to Lomita, California, where they lived in a trailer and in poverty. On March 28th, 1953, while eating dinner with Patricia, he went into heart failure for the third time and was taken to the hospital unconscious. He was revived for a little bit and was able to speak, but then lost consciousness again and passed away at the age of 64. Sad end to his life, unfortunately. Definitely. Um, Yeah, things were not so great there. 
at the end. Uh, but mm -hmm. as you've probably noticed by the running time for this episode, that's not the end of his story, even though he passed away. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to take actually a quick little break, and then we're going to come back and talk about uh, some pretty important things that happened after he died. And, you know, some good things that unfortunately, you know, it would have been better if it happened while he was alive, but at least it did happen. So uh, we'll take a quick little break and then we'll be right back. So following Thorpe's death, his supporters made off and on attempts to have his Olympic medals and titles reinstated. And they would emphasize the fact that Thorpe had been unaware of the rules around amateurism at the time, kind of like what he had pointed out in that letter that he had written to James Sullivan at the AAU. But those efforts were continuously shot down by members of the U.S. Olympic Committee and also IOC President Avery Brundage. In fact, one of Brundage's remarks about these attempts was, Ignorance is no excuse. So, yeah, you know, again, this is why we don't love this guy <laughs> very much. He was just not going to hear anything at all about this situation. You talked about your conspiracy theory and mine, too, honestly, earlier. Uh, Sarah, the screenwriter in me, really wants to go further in making Brundage the villain here and make him the guy who stole Thorpe's shoes. Because uh, we know he didn't run in the 1500, right? He he had he had dropped out. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know who stole them. But uh, yeah, the storyteller in me really wants it to be Brundage and that he was just jealous, mm -hmm. kind of like you said earlier. So. I'm going to I'm going to claim it. Again, <laughs> yeah. fact checkers, fact checkers don't come for me. Yeah, um, yeah, because this is not <laughs> historical at all. This is not backed up by any kind of fact. This is just our pure conjecture. Hey, bye. If you're, but if you are listening to this and you have a different conspiracy, please let us know. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So here, here is what's historical, though. So we'll get back to facts that we can actually prove is that Brundage died in 1975. And with new leadership at the IOC, plus changing sentiments about the acceptance for professional athletes in sport, the door opened once again for Thorpe's supporters to start a new petition on his behalf. In 1982, one of Thorpe's biographers, writer Robert Wheeler, and his wife Florence Ridlin started the Jim Thorpe Foundation to attempt a new petition and to prove that Thorpe had been disqualified after the 30-day protest period outlined in the official rules for the 1912 Games. In other words, they were no longer pleading ignorance to the rules. They were pointing out that the IOC had not followed its own rules, which smart move. Finally, yeah. like I don't want to say finally, but seriously, smart move. Put it on them. They right. they dropped the ball here. Yeah. And through their efforts, on October 13th of that same year, the IOC finally publicly recognized this fact and that Thorpe should have never been stripped of his medals and Olympic titles thus returning his status as the Olympic gold medalist in the pentathlon and decathlon and reinstating his status as a world record holder. Now, one note is that instead of returning the medal standings to their original status, they made Thorpe co-champion with Sweden's Hugo Weislander in the pentathlon and Norway's Ferdinand B in the decathlon. The IOC created two official replica medals from the 1912 Games and presented these to Thorpe's children, Gail and Bill, in a ceremony on January 18, 1983. Another petition was started in July of 2020 to call upon the IOC to make Thorpe the lone gold medalist in the two events and return the results to their original standings. And supposedly there is a new movie being made about his life, but looks like it hasn't gotten that far yet. If you want to sign that petition or learn more about this movie, the website is brightpath.com. Yeah, so... That link is going to be in the show notes if you want to go check that out. I stumbled across it while doing the research. Again, you know, uh, Hollywood stuff. So, you know, we'll see if the movie actually gets uh, made. But uh, but but they are yeah. running this petition as well, trying to return his status 
as the lone gold medalist. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, we try to mostly stick to facts here, but what's your feelings on that? Like, is that the right move to return the medal standings to the way they were for 1912? Do you have a hot take on that? <laughs> oh, gosh, that's hard. You know, I, I don't want to say I have a hot take. It's hard to have mixed feelings about mm -hmm. it. You know, I think back to the 2002 figure skating scandal mm -hmm. with the uh, pairs, yeah. which <laughs> that'll be a fun episode someday. Yep. <laughs> There's documentaries that you can find. We're not going to get into yeah. that. But there ended up being basically two Olympic champions in the pairs event yeah. after a bunch of controversy. And so, you know, I know it's happened, but that's like the thing I can think of in recent memory. I feel, I feel like because so much time has passed, it's really hard to go back to the original, but mm -hmm. also no, I think if I, I think if I had to decide, like I'm, <laughs> I'm conflicted on this. I don't want to be insensitive to the families of these athletes, yeah. but it's also like this happened so long ago. Um, it's not like these athletes are getting sponsorship opportunities by saying that they're an Olympic champion right. um, because they're no longer with us. Yeah. Um, so as much as it stinks, like I lean towards go back to the original standings because the IOC broke their own rules. Like when you think about it that yeah. way, it's hard for me to get past. They screwed up. Mm -hmm. This is on them. It once again, people in leadership failing the athletes, like all the confusion with it. Yeah. Um, it's not the athlete's fault, but yeah, I don't know. It's like, yeah. go back to the original standings, but put a little... Ah, mark there to, <laughs> yeah. yeah um so i i don't know i'm very conflicted yeah i see it going both ways what do you think um here here's my opinion of it because i mean it's just my opinion and i have no say in the matter i think they should go back to the original standings for the most part um because unlike the 2002 situation which was in figure skating which is an incredibly mm -hmm. subjective sport OK, right. Pentathlon decathlon are not subjective. Yeah. And he was so good. He was so far ahead that I think they should return to the original standings with one exception. I think they should have two bronze medalists. I don't think they should take yeah. the bronze away that they reallocated. I, I think kind of like we see in judo, they should just leave. They should have two bronze medalists. And just be like, OK, our bad. We're not taking away your medal status <laughs> as a bronze medalist. But I think they should return it to the original because even even Weislander and, you know, Bia, as as we've mentioned, they both recognize Thorpe as the true champ. And we're mm -hmm. like, we don't deserve the gold medal. He he beat us. Right. So honestly, I think we'd be honoring even their wishes by returning it to the original yeah. standings that's yeah that's my take on it but yeah i agree with that i like the idea of two bronze medalists i've thought about it a lot and that's where i've landed <laughs> so um but yeah so you know at the end of the day at least he is recognized as a gold medalist again in both events and had his records reinstated as well um even though he did not live to see that happen at least it did happen i guess better late than never but uh let's talk about you know what his legacy was because that's why we do these episodes to begin with is think about the impact these athletes have made on sports so if you happen to visit the u.s olympic and paralympic museum um, I just checked and I do have a photo that we'll get on social media, but they do have a nice little portion of an exhibit with a few nods to Jim Thorpe, um, mm. which they talk about Carlisle, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. They have a program that's honoring him, um, but they do have his two reinstated gold medals on display in the museum. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool that yeah. it's accessible to the public. So we'll get a picture up of that. But if you happen to visit Colorado, stop by. No, absolutely. The yeah, the museum is definitely worth the visit. And honestly, you might need a couple of days to really <laughs> give mm -hmm. everything adequate amount of time. So 
as far as Thorpe's legacy, as we kind of let off, obviously he uh, is remembered as the first Native American gold medalist, and that's a huge uh, deal considering, as we talked about at the front end of the episode, the limited opportunities that we saw for that community of people at that time. Now, the Associated Press, I thought this was really cool, they have ranked him as the greatest athlete from the first half of the 20th century. Uh, ranking him with the likes of Babe Ruth and Michael Jordan. So that's pretty awesome and good company there. And in 1963, he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which I'm sure he would have been very proud of considering that was his favorite sport. Uh, there's also an association named after him that presents a Jim Thorpe Award every year to the best defensive back in college football since that was one of the many positions he played. And there's an annual pentathlon and decathlon meet between Germany and the U.S. that's named after him called the Thorpe Cup. So, yeah, he's got all this really cool stuff named after him. <laughs> Speaking of having things named after him, mm -hmm. the town of Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania is named in his <laughs> honor. And in 2019, the town also started a marathon in his honor, which is appropriate. Yep. The town also has a monument that contains his remains. The mound the monument sits on is actually made from dirt taken from both Oklahoma and also the Olympic Stadium in Stockholm, which that's actually kind of cool. There's been some controversy and legal battles over his resting place. But if you want to hear more about that or more about Thorpe's life in general, go check out the Stuff You Missed in History Class episodes about him. We have the first one linked in the show notes. Yeah, uh, that's a show that I follow. And I think they had four total episodes about the life of Jim Thorpe, which were really handy for when I started research for this episode uh, months ago. But definitely worth listening because they they go into a lot more detail than what we're able to just cover here. If you live in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, we'd love to hear from you. What's it like up there? <laughs> so, yeah, I would like to know. I know this probably wasn't necessarily the easiest <laughs> episode to listen to because it definitely had some highs. It definitely had some lows, but I think. Again, just to reiterate, I think it is really important that we remember people like Jim Thorpe because of the impact that they made and because we can learn a lot from his story and, and hopefully make improvements so that things like what happened to him don't happen to other athletes again. Yeah. Obviously, there were a lot of factors in there um, in terms of how he was treated because of his race and because of his background, because of the fact that he had no family support. There were a lot of issues there, but he should have never had his medals taken away. And it's hard to say the situation was made right since it didn't happen in his lifetime. But, you know, unfortunately, that's the way that things work sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I know this maybe isn't the happiest note <laughs> to end things on uh but with that uh that does conclude our first season of the games odyssey so uh, as we said at the top of the episode we are going to take a bit of time off so we can get a jump start on some research uh take care of some other life things going on like my younger son's adoption hearing that's coming up here really soon so that's fun uh but during our break please be on the lookout for those bonus episodes that we mentioned uh, and for the giveaways once we settle on what we are going to give away. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know, Sarah. I mean, maybe that's not really much of a break break for us, <laughs> but it'll be a little bit of a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we'll be we'll be posting some um, pictures that maybe haven't made it to social media yet um, about yeah. episodes or if we find more videos to share, then yeah, we'll be around. Yeah, we'll still be interacting with people. We just need a little bit of a break from the recording and editing and all of those things. <laughs> Which, so. let's be real, it's Jonathan that does all the editing. I'm just here for the fun. Yeah, well, there you go. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so in the meantime, it would mean a lot to us if you left a review or share the show with a friend. 
yes, we would highly appreciate you doing either of those things. Uh, but yeah, that's a wrap on season one of the game's Odyssey. And if you enjoyed this season, and we really hope you did, then don't forget to fill out that survey. Give us your two cents so that we can make things better for everyone, including ourselves because we think we can make it better for ourselves too. <laughs> so uh, we will be back uh, the week of August 22nd to kick off season two with Antwerp 1920. But until then, ought to see you later. The Games Odyssey podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content feature in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.